And it is my absolute pleasure at this time to introduce Vanellis. Vanellis Rodriguez was born far away from where she was supposed to be. She writes to go home. She doesn't write about what she knows. She writes about what she would like to know. Among those things, tightrope walking, crab fishing, Norwegians, and Bob Dylan. If the writing program gave out an award for the most depressing writer, she'd probably win it. <laughs> Nonetheless, she'd like you all to know that she is actually a very happy person. <laughs> Someday she'll finish and publish the book she's writing. Some famous author will read it and say, this is a really important book. Some big movie studio will buy the rights to the novel. Nick Cave and Warren Ellis will compose the score to the film adaptation. Awards will be won. In the meantime, she wants to sleep late and not worry about her student loans. <laughs> Vanellis Rodriguez, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, so there's a lot of people I want to thank. My family, they couldn't be here, but they're here in spirit. My friends for coming. Um, all of you guys for coming. Um, the faculty, especially Daniel and Anita for recognizing the long form writer in me before I did. Miranda for encouraging the strange and unexpected. My thesis committee, Hugh, Seatney, and Nan, especially Anne, who's been with me every step of the way. The, on this book, you know, thank you for everything you ever told me, for being tough when you needed to be. Your support and believe in me has been invaluable. And to all the students here, all of you guys are awesome, and I feel privileged to share the stage with you. I'm gonna read from my thesis, my novel. I'm gonna read from the first chapter. So it's called White Space for now. This is like the 10th title it's had so don't get too attached to it. <laughs> okay. There was no body there waiting at the airport. Oslo, a most aloof hostess. Old, cold metal and glass. Red-eyed creatures crazed with sleep deprivation. A language beyond her understanding and his routine. A sky aching toward dawn. The night wind relentless. Damped with the threat of rain, it pricked at their skin, stinging like paper cuts. Their breath materializing before completely escaping their mouths, so cold out, colder than he remembered it being around this time of year. Him bearing, bearing it stoically, her twitching knees a sign of her thin blood and her stubbornness. He had told her to pack a warmer coat. The Oslo brand of cold was not the same kind they were used to in Berkeley, but she insisted she'd be fine with the one she brought. Her shoulders creeping ever closer to her neck and ears, a retreating turtle. He coiling his arms around her waist, she resisting him. He tightening his hold and she hugging him back. And then it's so easy to pretend the reason of their visit is an entirely different one. Their first trip to Norway was years in the making. They had a joint savings account and a color-coded itinerary saved on Leilani's computer. Purple for the places in Spence list, green for Leilani's. It should have been March and not October, baby Hallie's first birthday and not an impending visit to the trauma center. The bank account had been nearly drained to pay for the emergency trip, and instead of waiting in line for a rental car, Sven and Leilani stood in the pre-dawn light for their chance at a taxi. When one finally came, Leilani hurried inside the car to escape the cold. Sven couldn't make his body follow hers. He stood benumbed staring at the swath of burnt orange that cut through the autumnal black of the morning sky. He took a deep breath. The chilled air dried his mouth, his throat, and made his lungs spasm. He needed to cough, felt the reflex pulsing in his stomach, his chest all the way up to his throat. His muscles flexed with the need to expel the trapped air, but instead, Sven held onto it and forced his body to stop breathing. There was a real somatic pain accompanying the conscious choice to deprive his body of oxygen. A taut, heavy bubble wedged between his lungs that expanded conversely with every breath he didn't take. Three minutes was all the brain needed before it betrayed the body and shut down forever. Sven knew that much. 
like he knew that lime green was the only flavor of Swedish fish candy Leilani could stand, that acrylic paint dried faster than oil, and that a red dawn meant trouble out at sea. If he, that is, Sven's brother, had been out on the boat that day, his life might have been threatened all the same. But he wasn't. He lay in a hospital bed, had lain bloodied and broken in the middle of a busy avenue at one in the morning. Jürgen should have known better. Sven's mother, their mother, rasping into the phone in that sickening, chalky tone, he could hear her again, saying things that made no sense. Wet roads, faulty brakes, punctured lungs, respiratory failure. What the hell was Jorgen thinking? The bubble in Sven's chest grew, swelled to the point of burning, and the world half at the seam, slipped out the ed edges of Sven's vision, sliding away, leaving nothing but blackness and the ever-engorging bubble. Just a puncture, and it would be the end of everything, felled by a crack, by a maintenance oversight, and the world conspiring against you, wet roads, faulty brakes, respiratory failure. Is that really how it ends? Strangle the bubble, prick it to death, rip it apart before it. Sven coughed and coughed until he gagged. Slowly, he breathed in and out, again until the gulf left by the bubble was bridged. His entire body shook with relief. He heard Leilani call his name from inside the car, then saw her poke her head out. Her features were lined with concern, but he couldn't worry about her right now. He slid in beside her and pulled the door shut. Yulevol University Hospital, he mumbled to the driver, and the car took off. The driver tried to engage him in conversation as soon as they pulled out of the curb. He asked where they were coming from, as o if Oslo was home. Sven didn't answer. His left leg bounced up and down in rapid, jerky intervals. He felt more than saw Leilani rest her hand on his knee. He dislodged it with the flex of his muscles. The driver spoke again. It won't be long until the first snow, I suspect, don't you think? Sven huffed and rolled, rolled his eyes, irritated at the man for reasons he couldn't determine. He fished his cell phone out of the front pocket of his jeans. He caught his reflection on the black, lifeless screen and felt disgust at the fear etched in the lines around his mouth and eyes. He pressed the power button and waited for the phone to come back to life. It was 7.04 in the morning, Oslo time. Nearly 26 hours since Sven's mother and sister had interrupted his early dinner with Leilani. 28 hours since Jorgen had last breathed on his own. There were 12 text messages in his inbox, all from his sister each a variation of call me, ranking from please call me when you land in London to are you here yet to call me now. The voicemail icon was also illuminated. Do you wish to listen to the messages now? His phone asked. Sven's thumb hovered over the key that would make the call. A minute flex of his thumb was all that stood between him and full knowledge of what had happened to his brother. One press and the wait would be at long last over. But deep within the marrow of his bones, he felt the message wouldn't say anything he didn't already know. So he pressed the red cancel button instead, returned the phone to his pocket, and pretended not to know what he already knew. Outside of their temporary shelter, Oslo unveil it unveiled itself to them already ravaged by a winter not yet come. The trees had rid themselves of their dressings, naked skeletons looming like watchmen over the city. The first snow had yet to fall, but the city already looked like a black and white painting. It'd been spring the last time Sven was in Oslo, everything covered in color, shades so extraordinary that could only occur in nature, now only brown, black, and gray, the colors of age, death, and decay. Piles of falling appendages lined the sidewalks and the pathways, covered under a blanket of brittle leaves, a sharp contrast to the seeming painlessness of the change of seasons suggested by calendars and postcards, where nature's golden hues detract from the inerrant violence of the season. Sven knew better, to, better than to think that the fall was painless. Like blood, leaves turned red before fading into brown, and the proof of their aliveness cur currently contracted and expanded in the old natural apparatus working in his chest, the same machine that failed his brother. Was it like that, Jorgen? as painless as a glossy autumn. There was something disappointing about the sight of Yulevold University Hospital. With its slanted shingled roof and small glass windows, it could have been any other building in the city. Sven found its commonness almost insulting. He collected their bags from the trunk while Leilani settled the bill. She had to use a credit card, as neither, he, neither of them had thought to get Kroner at the airport. When she was done, she took the wheeled suitcase from him. He made as if to take it back from her, 
but a raised eyebrow stopped him. A large clock tower rose from the hospital's main structure. The clock read 727. Since he'd answered his mother's call, Sven had wished he could find a way to slow time down, prolong the moments, as if inertia could somehow keep his brother from the undesired end. Somehow, Sven had convinced himself that the longer it took him to get to Oslo, the longer it would take death to come and collect Jorgen. But he finally landed in his birthland, and there was no more time to waste or delay. Sven navigated the labyrinthine wall hallways of the hospital as if he knew where he was going, despite the fact that he had never been there before. The main doors had opened effortlessly for them, an ironic welcoming gesture. Sven didn't stop to ask for directions. For logistic purposes, he knew trauma centers and intensive care units were usually located on the first floor. So Sven crossed the sterile, polished lobby and walked to the back of the hospital. The inside of the building was a never-ending network of dead ends, and just when Sven was getting ready to give up, walk back to the lobby and start again, they finally stopped in front of the neurotrauma intensive care unit. There was another set of automatic doors at the entrance, further reminding Sven that the patients inside were not like the rest of them. The walls were painted stark white. There were two sitting areas, one on each side of the room, with several wooden chairs around a coffee table. The lounge was clean, almost too clean, as evidenced by the burning smell of industrial grade antiseptic cleaner. But the tables were still littered with newspapers, old editions of Hello Magazine, styrofoam co coffee cups, and sandwich wrappers. There were no empty chairs in the room. The occupants looked as tired and unwashed as Sven and Milani did. They all had that crazed look around their eyes, and Sven felt like at any given moment, any of them would break into a scream. He wondered if he looked like that. He approached the nurse's station, which was at the end of the waiting lounge. There were two nurses in shift, so young, probably just out of school. The blonde was busy on the phone while the brunette organized files and clipboards. Sven cleared his throat, and the brunette nurse looked at him from the corner of her eye, but did not immediately come to assist him. Was she bored, too busy for him? Sven knocked his fist against the counter, uncaring of how rude the gesture would seem. Leilani squeezed his shoulder, and he spun around. What? he said. Leilani pointed somewhere out of his immediate view, and then he saw them gather at the end of the hallway to the left of the nurse's station. His younger sister, Ingrid, the only one of the tr three siblings who inherited her, their mother's red hair, their mother, and Gita, Jürgen's wife, Sven hastened to their side, his frustration with the nurse forgotten. The wheels of Leilani's suitcase clicked conspicuously behind him. The three women went slack as soon as they saw him. Ingrid on his mother sighed in relief. Gita wouldn't meet his eyes. It was only the third time Sven had seen his mother in five years, but he could barely look at her. She looked as frail as old as he remembered her, much too old for a woman of 53. A shawl loosely draped across her shoulders. His baby sister's beautiful red hair was tangled and lusterless. In Gita, her, her eyelids were red and inflamed, her blue eyes vitreous and vacant. She wore only jeans and a flimsy t-shirt, a damp patch on the fabric over her right breast. She held herself straight despite the fact that she must have been freezing inside the crisp board. She held her arms awkwardly at, at her sides as if she didn't know what to do with them. They looked alarmingly empty. Where is the baby? Ingrid was the first to break. She let out a tiny sound. It almost could have been confused for, for a hiccup were it not for the grief distorting her face. She latched onto Sven and cried soundlessly into his neck. The last time Sven saw her cry, she was 13. Eric Danielson, her first boyfriend, had just broken her heart. Sven let the duffel bag slip from his shoulder and fall to the ground. He wrapped both arms around his sister. He sniffed her hair, trying to rid himself of the disgusting stench of death that hovered in the air, but he found no trace of her fragrant shampoo. They were too late. They were too late, and now his brother was dead and gone somewhere with, where Sven couldn't reach him, where he couldn't follow. He felt as if he was underwater. Gita and his mother were stalks of algae swaying in the current. He saw his mother's mouth open to let sound out, but he got lost somewhere along the way. Ingrid stepped back, dried her tears with the hem of her sweater. She shook her head and said, not yet, as if she knew with certainty the turn Sven's thoughts had taken. Her words simultaneously built up and destroyed Sven's hopes. Not yet? What does that mean? What happened? He asked. His head wound was worse than they thought. Ingrid paused and snuck a glance at their mother. She stepped closer to Sven and lowered the pitch of her voice. 
The doctor says he's brain dead, that there's nothing they can do for him. He's not going to wake up. We were going to, we didn't want to do it without you here. Sven felt as if his lungs were being strung out and tightened over a stretcher like yards of canvas. And suddenly he was six years old again the morning of the first snowfall, where he ran outside with only a t-shirt on, ignoring his mother's warnings. The air had hit him so hard as if someone were, someone were digging th their knees into his ribcage that he felt as if he would never breathe again. The chill left him as soon as it came. Sven looked at Leilani. He knew she'd want to know the news about Jorgen, but he couldn't bring himself to translate what Ingrid had said. Couldn't say the words out loud. Wouldn't. He knew what the diagnosis really meant. He'd read Leilani's books. A dead brain in a warm body. Kidneys still filtering. Heart beating. A body capable of fever, rashes, eruptions, excrements, erections. Neither a cadaver nor a person. Jürgen wasn't supposed to go like this. Thank you. <laughs>